Hello, and welcome to Williams Mullins Benefits Companion, a podcast that helps employers navigate the complex legal challenges of managing their employee benefit plans. I'm your host, Bryden DeWitt, and today I'm joined by Ken Barnes, Senior Investment Consultant at Sage U Advisory Group. Welcome, Ken. Thanks, Bryden. Thanks for having me. Ken is here to talk about Qualified Default Investment Alternatives, or QDIAs, and your QDIAs have been around for a while, but Ken, for our listeners, uh, can you just start off from the beginning? You know, what is a qualified default investment alternative, and and what is some background on how they came to be? Yeah, no, uh, thanks for thanks again for having me, and this is probably one of my favorite topics to discuss with our plan sponsor clients. It's it's really the, probably the most impactful topic from an investment standpoint to discuss with with plan sponsors because when you look at a retirement plan. The vast majority of our our, our plans have the, the biggest portion of assets invested in the QDIA. So to answer your question, I'll go back to 2006. And in, in 2006, uh, President Bush signed the Pension Protection Act, or PPA, into law. So the PPA removed barriers that prevented employers from adopting automatic enrollment. Uh, before PPA was passed, plan sponsors fear liability, actually, for, for market fluctuations. And this prevented most from adopting automatic enrollment. Or if, if they did use it, they selected a low risk, low return option like a um, stable value fund. But PPA created a path for plan sponsor safe harbor for auto enroll. It also created the, the qualified default investment alternative, or, or QDIA, which allows plan sponsors to invest their participants in a risk or age-based investment option like a target date fund when that participant does not make an active investment selection on their own. QDIAs are really important for plan sponsors because under ERISA Section 404C, plan fiduciaries are not responsible for the investment choices made by participants if certain requirements, disclosure, and other requirements are met. If you have a plan participant who is on autopilot or auto enrolled and not really engaged, they may, you know, often they are not making their own investment elections. So absent the concept of the QDIA, the plan fiduciaries would be responsible for how the assets are being invested for participants who aren't making investment elections because they're not making their own elections. It's it's then the plan sponsor making the elections. So a QDIA is a safe harbor for plan sponsors to be relieved of fiduciary responsibility for basically selecting on behalf of participants where their money is being invested. Right. Ken, what kind of investments qualify as QDIAs? Yeah, so the the Department of Labor advises that a, a QDIA must be diversified so as to minimize the risk of large losses. And to assist employers in selecting QDIAs, the DOL issued a final regulation that outlined uh, really the characteristics of these types of investments. And specifically, there, there are four major types, or there are four types, I should say, of QDIAs. Managed accounts, uh, target date funds, balance funds, and then the fourth type is a capital preservation product, kind of like a um, stable value fund. That can only be used for the first 120 days of participation and we, we really rarely see this option utilized. I think in my 10 years with SageU, I've seen it utilized in one client plan. So what are the pros and cons of each of these different types of QDIA investments? Yeah, and I'll start in order from kind of your less customized QDIA to your more customized QDIA. So that takes me to balanced funds. And uh, a balanced funds are a really easy to understand. They're a straightforward way to invest. Um, in general, they offer a mix of stocks and bonds and have an allocation somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% stocks and 40% bonds. Now, while balance funds are a very straightforward, diversified investment, they are not based on the needs of an individual participant in their time horizon. Instead, balanced funds are based on the entire population demographic. And what ends up happening is you have participants who are either really underweight equity or overweight equity. So a participant who's 25 years old with 40 years to retire in a balanced fund will have the same asset allocation as a 60-year-old with five years left to retirement. So we've really seen plan sponsor utilization of balanced funds be pretty minimal in recent years. So kind of next on that spectrum would be target date funds. Target date funds have been the 
biggest beneficiary by far of the passage of PPA, and they're the most common QDIA. Morningstar releases an annual update on target date funds called their target date landscape report. And in 2023, they found that there was $2.82 trillion in target date funds. That's actually down from 2021 when there was over $3 trillion invested in target date funds. And that, that's based on market losses last year, the only reason you saw a decline. But over the last decade, target date assets have increased by 10x. And, and, and those not familiar with the target date funds, they're an age-based diversified investment. Um, target date funds are invested more aggressively for younger participants. And as that individual approaches their target date or their retirement, the investment automatically de-risks and becomes more conservative. They're designed as kind of a one-size-fits-all investment. And they assume that everyone of the same age has the same financial situation and risk tolerance. Now, I really do think target date funds are a great solution for the majority of plan participants. But the one criticism I have is the lack of customization for participants, especially those approaching retirement or with more complex financial situations. Now, while target date funds were designed for the masses, they're not really designed, like I said earlier, for the individual investor. And that takes us to kind of the most customized QDI, and that's that's managed accounts. Managed account services have been around for a long time. And while we've seen plan sponsors add them as kind of an opt-in option for their plan participants, we haven't seen widespread adoption yet with managed accounts as a QDIA. Now, managed account service, unlike target date funds, considers a wide variety of personal data, such as your risk tolerance, your age, um, your income, whether you have outside assets like a pension plan, uh, your savings rate, your account balance. And they use all of this data to create a customized asset allocation for each individual participant. Now, this certainly seems like the most optimal approach for individuals, but there's generally an increased cost to individuals using managed accounts for that level of personalization. So we also, from a con standpoint, have seen that managed account services may not be quite as well understood by plan sponsors or individual participants which has also probably stalled its use as a QDIA and is, is why it's probably more utilized on an opt-in basis by employers. And you mentioned cost. I mean, that would be a consideration for fiduciaries when selecting a QDIA. What are, what are some of the other considerations that plan fiduciaries should take into account? Yeah, and so when, when considering the most appropriate uh, QDIA for their participants, there are really a number of factors to consider. Cost certainly being one of them, as you mentioned. Um, but when we work with clients, we want to understand plan demographics. Um, we want to understand participant behavior. Uh, so whether participants are leaving their money in the plan when they retire, whether they're withdrawing it, rolling it to an IRA. Um, we also want to know what, what's the financial sophistication of the participant base. And within, I mentioned the plan demographics, specifically what we're looking at, we're actually looking at data points like participant age, number of terminated participants, the compensation the current asset allocation of, of employees, employee turnover. Uh, we look at all of these things to give the plan sponsors a, kind of a, an idea of how their participant demographic interacts with the plan. We also really want to understand from plan sponsors what their goals are for the plan, whether they want to kind of usher their participants through retirement and keep them within the, the retirement plan. We really think it's important that plan sponsors need to periodically evaluate and, and just as important document that, that QDIA selection process, why a QDIA was selected and why it's the most appropriate for their plan participants. Have you seen any trends as far as if a participant is in a QDIA, they are automatically enrolled in the plan, they didn't take any action to be enrolled in the plan. Do participants tend to move out of the QDIA and start taking hold of the reins? or participants in the QDA pretty much stay there? They pretty much stay there is what we've yeah. seen. Uh, we've had a few clients who may have previously used a less optimal QDIA, like a, a balance fund, and they wanted to move to target date funds. And so we've re-enrolled the entire participant base into um, the age-appropriate QDIA. And what happens there is probably about 90% of the participants stay in the QDIA, and maybe you get 10% opt out and build their own asset allocation. But really, once a participant's defaulted into investment, we see that default is very sticky. 
Well, as you mentioned, QDAs have been around for a while. How have they evolved in recent years? Target date funds, like I mentioned, are the, the most popular by a really wide margin. There's an industry survey called the Plan Sponsor Defined Contribution Survey. In that 73% of those respondents use a target date fund as their default investment. But what we initially saw after the passage of, of PPA was plan sponsors tended to select a target date fund affiliated with their record keeper without a lot of due diligence. So, and I'm not picking on, on any one series or any one record keeper here, but if, if I were a plan sponsor using Fidelity, for example, as my record keeper, there was a pretty good likelihood that I was probably using the Fidelity Freedom series as my PDIA. There's nothing wrong with that, with using your a record keepers target date series TDIA, but there really needs to be a process utilized to document that selected target date fund. And the deal actually released tips to help plan sponsors choose a suitable target date series in, in 2013. Beyond target date funds, there's there's really been four trends that I've seen from both asset managers and record keepers in the types of QDIAs available in recent years. So First, just really quickly, we've seen a, a trend towards collective investment trusts instead of their mutual fund counterparts. There were projections that I actually saw, I think last week, that CITs are on pace to overtake mutual funds as the most popular target date vehicle in the next two years. Wow. And CITs took in about 79% of target date fund assets last year. So that's that's significant. The move to CITs is primarily to help plan sponsors and participants lower the cost of the investments in the plan. So um, just for, for those not aware of what a CIT is, the really quick overview, they're similar to a mutual fund in that they're a pooled investment vehicle, but they have, they have different supervision. They're a little bit less burdensome in terms of reporting and re administrative requirements. And they're also, they're not available to individual investors. Um, participants can only, really only access these in their retirement accounts. And what we've seen because of the less burdensome reporting and administrative requirements, they result in cost savings for participants, which is why we've seen a pretty big move to CITs from mutual funds in recent years. Next trend that we've seen is, is for more customization in the QDIA. So really in two different ways. The first way being custom target date funds. So custom target date funds actually allow a plan sponsor along with a 338 investment manager to create a target date series from the underlying investments available in their 401k or retirement plan. So the target date fund can actually use kind of multiple best in class managers. So if your plan offers Fidelity, Vanguard, t Price, I'm just naming a, a few investment companies, you can actually use those underlying managers to build your target date fund all in the same series. Now, this is a bit different than the off the shelf target date funds that most people are used to that use a single investment manager for all of the underlying strategy. It also allows plan sponsors to have a glide path that's specifically made for their participant demographic. Previously, we saw custom target date series really only available to plan sponsors on certain record keeping platforms. Prudential was the biggest one previously. And then we also really only saw them used by the largest plan sponsors because it was cost prohibitive. But the cost of adding these custom target date funds has really come down in recent years. Uh, and the availability on different record keeping platforms has increased. So as, as a result, we've seen clients of all different sizes kind of exploring whether a custom target date series may make sense for their plan. The next kind of more customized QDIA is the idea of a hybrid QDIA. Under this approach, the QDIA is a hybrid of a target date fund for younger participants and a managed account for participants closing in on retirement. So target date funds are used for those younger participants. Allocations are aggressive at that point in the individual's life. And their, their financial situation is probably a bit less complex when they're earlier in their career. But as that participant approaches retirement, their financial situation oftentimes becomes more complex and at that point, the participant would be enrolled in a managed account. So instead of using only age or time, like I mentioned earlier, the managed account, they, they can use a dozen or more data points, to create a more personalized advice and give a portfolio that's more specific to that portfolio. So we've seen interest in plan sponsors who've looked for ways to provide their pre-retiree employees with additional guidance and, and tools as they re approach retirement age. And then really one last thing that we've seen as a trend, 
and that we've been hearing a ton about in recent years is a really we've been hearing this from insurance companies and a, a few different asset managers is the idea of embedding a retirement income strategy or guaranteed income product like an annuity within a target date series. So the way these solutions work is like a normal target date fund where it's aggressive for your younger individuals and more conservative for those approaching retirement. But the big difference is as participants approach retirement, a portion of that target date portfolio is actually invested in a lifetime income product like an annuity. So the goal of these solutions is to take the guesswork out of income in retirement by providing a guaranteed income stream, kind of like a uh, personal pension plan for the individual participant. So we've seen just a, a number of trends and the, the whole QDI landscape has really gotten, I'd say, more complex in recent years. And I think you know, the QDA is there for participants who aren't really paying attention and aren't actively engaged in their 401k plan and investments. But the same goes for plan uh, fiduciaries and retirement plan committees that, you know, this information you've said today, you know, about the trends and the changes in QDIAs, really a plan fiduciaries can't be on autopilot either with respect to the QDIA yeah. that maybe they selected 10 years ago uh, that the QDIA should be reviewed. And, and these options should be considered by plan fiduciaries. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the most important takeaway is as, as we've seen the evolution of target date funds is that plan fiduciaries really should be evaluating their QDI and ensuring that it's, it's still the most appropriate option for their participants and documenting that process they took to kind of determine um, their QDIA. Well, Ken, thank you so much for joining us on the Benefits Companion again. And thanks so much for having me, Bryden. That will wrap up our discussion on QDIAs. If listeners have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, please contact me. You can also visit our employee benefits page at williamsmullen.com slash employee benefits. There you can find out more about our team as well as past episodes of this podcast and legal alerts. Thank you for listening.